and ran out of wine. The Bible says that Jesus took something that was weak in taste, like water, and he gave it power by turning it into wine. I want to pause there real quickly to say that's what God wants to do in the life of the Christian. He wants to take someone that's weak in faith like water and give you the Holy Spirit and make you powerful like wine. Where your taste changes because of the change that Jesus has made in you since you came in contact with him. Uh, as we leave there, the Bible says Jesus leaves that place and as he leaves that place, he's on his way, hallelujah, uh, to meet with Nicodemus and on his way there, the Bible says that the people are in the temple. And let, let me bring some clarification to it. Jesus is not or does not have a problem with them selling. But the Bible says he has a problem with the people because, or, or better yet, the temple, because they're taking advantage of the people. And they're selling to the people uh, things that were uh, not worth the value that they were selling it to the people for. That's why we got to read our word, because we say that Jesus turned the tables over, meaning that there wasn't supposed to be any selling in the church. But that's not what was going on in the Bible. Uh, because we'll discover that oftentimes in the church, it didn't just start now, but even from Old Testament till now, they often sold things in the church. Y'all don't like me here. Hallelujah to God. And the Bible is teaching us that Jesus doesn't have a problem with them selling stuff. He just has a problem that, with the fact that they're taking advantage of the people that they're selling to. So something that was worth $2, they were selling it for $10. And Jesus is saying, I have a problem when you take advantage of the people. And he goes in the temple and he turns over the tables because of the people asking for more than what they were supposed to be asking for. Then we come into uh, John chapter 3. And the whole time Jesus is doing this, the Bible says that his Fame is spreading abroad. And the people are following him and want to know him and want to get an audience with Mr. Jesus. As they want to get an audience with him, the Bible says that there's a man who says, well, since I can't get an audience with you in front of all these people, he says, what I will do is come meet you at night. This man's name is Nicodemus. The Bible says that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him, well, Nicodemus, if you want to have eternal life, he says, you must be born again. Uh, he says, in order to be born again, he says, you're not going to enter back into your mother's womb. He says, but you must be baptized with water and with spirit. Hallelujah. Then after we look at this, the Bible says, then we go into John chapter 4. Just stick with me because I'm going somewhere. As we get into John chapter 4, Jesus tells his disciples, I must pass through Samaria. As he passed through Samaria, he comes in contact with a woman who was at the well trying to get something to drink. As this woman is at the well trying to get something to drink, the Bible says that Jesus looks at her and says, well, lady, he says, if you want something to drink, why didn't you just ask me? The woman looks at Jesus and says, aren't you a Jew? He says, and Jews has nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus looks at the woman and says, I'm not here because I care about where you come from. He says, but I'm here because I understand that you have a need. He says, and I know you have a need because uh, you've been with a couple of men. He says, and the one, man you, the one man you have in your house is not your husband. And he says, but if you get this man, and if you drink of this cup, he says, you will never thirst again. He says, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. He says, and once you get this water, where well, you're never thirsty again, he says, what happens is, you will automatically become a worshiper. She looks at Jesus.
Jesus and says, Jesus, how dare you talk about worship when we have to go to the high place? We've got to go to the mountain. Jesus looks at her and says, woman, do you not understand that there's a day coming where we won't worship in this mountain nor that one? He says, but they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. He says, because when you get that spiritual worship, it takes you from the valley to the mountain. I wish I had someone here that understood. When you were a worshiper, you automatically transition from a valley or low place into a high place. Worship will take you from hell to happiness in 10 seconds. Y'all ain't talking to me here. Worship will take you, amen, from a bad place to a good place. You can be at work having a bad day and go to the bathroom and start worshiping God. And all of a sudden, your spirit man changes. That's why you got to know the difference between praise and worship. See, praise is very emotional. Amen. Sometimes people are praising, amen, just because they're thinking about how good God's been. But when you are a worshiper, you're not thinking about how good he's been. You're thinking about who he is. And you're just glad that you got a relationship with him. See, when you're a worshiper, you're happy that you can call him no matter where you are. Y'all ain't talking to me here. See, real worshipers can call Jesus to you no matter where you are in your life. You can call him to your broke situation. You can call him to your troubled home. You can call him to your messed up children. You can call him, amen, to things not being what you need them to be. And when you begin to worship God, he'll take you out the natural and begin to put you in the spiritual. And he'll begin to give you some hope you ain't never had before. And even though you were having a bad day at work, you'll step out that bathroom like something that happened to you. What happened to you? It ain't nothing happened. I just went and had a conversation with Jesus. And he let me know that everything is going to be on. Or you want to look at somebody and tell them there's power in work. Yes. Yes. Jesus looks at her. Glory to God. And when he looks at her, he says, woman, he says, you must understand there's a day coming where you're not going to have to go to a mountain to worship me, but I'll be the mountain on the inside of you. So Jesus teaches us greater is he that's in us. Hallelujah. Than he that's within the world. What Jesus is saying is, I want to be great in you. I want to be the mountain of hope in you. I want to be big in you. I want to take all of me and put him in a little bit of you. And what we see is here is God and his fame is consistently or constantly spreading. Then we get to chapter 5 and we get to chapter 5. Amen. The Bible says that there's a man who's sitting at a porch at the pool of Bethesda. The Bible says as he's there, Jesus goes to him and says, Wilt thou be made whole? In, in, in other words, he says, Can I heal you? Yeah. And instead of the man saying, Yes, Lord, you can heal me, the man goes to complain. And he says, Well, Jesus, every time I try to get a healing, he says, There's no one here to put me in the water. He says, But someone beats me to the punch and gets to the water while the water is troubled and I can't get my miracle. Jesus looks at the man and says, I'm not asking you about the water. He says, I'm not even asking you about your situation. I'm asking you, can I heal you? Oh, that's some good news there. Oh, you want to look at somebody and look at him and say, neighbor, can he heal you? Can he heal you? He's not asking you about your situation. He's not asking you what you're going through. He's not asking you how your situation looks. But he wants to know, can I heal you? He looked at the man and said, I'm not worried about what you're going through. Quit telling me how bad your day is and just let me heal you, man. The Bible says that after he healed the man, the man took the bed he was laying on and took it and, hallelujah, put it on his back. Hallelujah. And as he took the bed and put it on his back, the Bible says he began to go and tell everybody about how good God is. Look what he's done in my life. After we leave chapter 5, we then get into chapter 6. 
And the Bible says that the fame of Jesus had spread so strongly that now there were about 5,000 men that were following behind Jesus. Now you got to look at the text. When the text says there was 5,000 men, the text was being gender specific, which means it was only talking about men. It was not talking about the women and the children that were following behind him. So after you add up all the numbers, you will understand that there was at least 20,000 people that were following behind Jesus. They had heard about what he did at the porch. They had heard about what he did at the wedding. They had heard about what happened with Nicodemus. And these people were following him for a miracle. The Bible says that when they got to Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus saw the crowd. The Bible says that he looked at Philip and says, Philip, testing his faith. He says, Philip, he says, let's get these people something to eat. Philip looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, all we have is 200 pence. Hallelujah. 200 pence was about four to eight months wages. He says, that's not enough to feed 20,000 people. He looked at Andrew, the other disciple, and he said, Andrew, he said, do we have anything to feed these people? Andrew looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, all we have is a poor man's lunch. Y'all been talking to me here. He said, all we have is two fish and five barley loaves. When he looks at him and says, we have two fish and five barley loaves, you got to understand how poor of a lunch that was. You must understand that he mentioned barley loaves, amen, trying to show us that this is all this little boy had. It was very poor. It was nothing. And some of you all are complaining about your oodles and noodles, but this barley loaf was something that they didn't even give to humans. This was bread they fed to animals. It was hard. Y'all ain't talking to me here. It was stale. It was nasty. It had a lot of grain in it. It was not a good tasting bread. But the Bible says that Jesus took that bread. He lifted it up to God and he broke it and he passed it. And he broke it and he passed some more. And he broke it and he passed some more. And he broke it and he passed some more. And he broke it and he passed some more. And he broke it and he five pieces of bread and two he broke it and he passed some more. He took five barley loaves and two pieces of fish and spread it out to 12 baskets. They took them 12 baskets and fed 20,000 people with two little fish and five pieces of bread. Oh my goodness, that was a good place to give God praise because you understand that anything you put in the hands of God, he can break some off and keep on passing. He can take a little bit and keep on feeding. Now you complaining about the 10% you give God. Do you not understand? He can take that 10%, break it off and pass some more. You only talking to me here. The Bible says that he broke off so much and